Um, I don't, I'm not really a wrestling fan. As a matter of fact, I, when I first started, I had very little respect for the sport because I have a background in another sport. And I looked at the wrestling more like entertainment and I looked down on it until Darren made me go to uh, wrestling school for like two months and really broke my ass. And then I slowly gained respect for these guys because even though it's, it's choreographed and it's entertainment, when you have someone who's 265 pounds throw, fuck, throwing you across the room, you get hurt. So um, as far as uh, <clears throat> you, you mentioned the wrestler's name you know, before, and uh, we did a lot of research looking at different wrestlers from the 60s all the way up to present day. And who, there's a lot of people who, in the wrestling business, that are, that are very famous, but they're not necessarily very good wrestlers. With the, it's like in the acting business, they're very good politicians, so they become famous. So there's a lot of wrestlers that are very good that don't even have a name, that you wouldn't even know and I won't remember, but uh, there were some guys from, <clears throat> I think the 70s that I really liked a lot, Steamboat somebody, who? Yeah. What was Steamboat's name? Ricky Steamboat. There was, um, I just wanted to say by the end of the, uh, by the end of the two months of him training, actually by the end of the movie, his teachers said that uh, he was a better worker than 80% uh, 80. 80. of the wrestlers out there. So like Mickey completely, I mean, you know, as we know, Mickey was a boxer at one point and for him, originally we were gonna train him in a boxing gym and it was just humiliating. He couldn't be in a boxing gym because Boxers, I didn't want to see anybody. He, box, he didn't want any wrestling. boxers to see him wrestling. But I think when you get to know these guys and you realize there's this history um, that comes out of uh, you know carnivals and freak shows, and that they actually a lot of their language is actually carny language. It's an ancient, ancient art, and uh, and then also the athleticism of of the sport is just very impressive. And so by the end, I think uh, I think Mickey had a lot of respect for the old timers. Well, you know, people, a lot of people recently, they use the word comeback, which, you know, if you look it up in the dictionary and you define it, it can mean many different things. Um, comeback, comeback from, you can come back from war with no legs, you can come back from dinner having, you know, just eating a ham sandwich or wiping your ass. Come back to me, I can't, there's, defining it's real hard because where I came back from, <laughs> uh, only... <laughs> Uh, only my little dogs would know, <laughs> you know. I think Mickey's had a very long trip, but... 15 you know, years. 15 years of a long trip away, but, um, I mean, the thing that's amazing is that it's, it's just always been there, and it's never gone anywhere. And from my, the first meeting I met Mickey, which he'll have a different version of it, uh, huh. I remember just seeing that impish smile of his and being like, realizing that you know, underneath all that, all, all that armor was this fragile eggshell. And I was almost like a kid in a candy store, just thrilled by how many different flavors there were. And I just couldn't wait to, to explore with him what we could do. So, you know, at the beginning of it, everyone was like, how are you gonna make Mickey Rourke sympathetic? And I was like, well, you've never met Mickey Rourke. He's the, the most empathetic person I've ever met. And so that was a big part of it. He uses these big, these big words. I don't even know what yeah, they mean. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> Play the dumb guy. Uh, I think, uh, you know, for me, Pi, Requiem, and The Fountain were definitely a body of work, and they were very related to each other, even though I, think, I hope they all had very different visual languages, but I, I do perceive them as a trilogy. And if Madonna taught us anything, it's that you need to reinvent yourself. Uh, and to Vogue. Oh, oh yeah, to Vogue. <laughs> and... Um, I guess, you know, so um, I, I just, that I, I was looking to try and do something new. And uh, when I first started studying filmmaking, I came from a cinema verite place, and a lot of my early work was documentary. So that was in my head, and then I met Mickey. And uh, I think uh, the visual style always needs to come out of the material. And in this case, it was, it was different, because I could have shot the wrestler in a lot of different ways, and I think the visual style came out of Mickey Rourke in the sense that um, between action and cut, I'm not really sure Mickey per knows exactly what's gonna happen. 
Um, and I don't know if that's completely accurate, but it's kind of anything can happen, and that's the excitement. And I wanted to create a playground for Mickey that, was, that he could do anything. So I hired a, a cinematographer, Maurice Alberte, who could create a 360 atmosphere where we could shoot anywhere. And uh, I created, handheld. and we created a handheld style so that we could really basically freeform with Mickey. And uh, then I found other actors, Marissa Tomei and Evan, who um, both were excited by that style that we were just gonna go out and shoot it. And I mean, Evan will tell you a great story about the first thing we shot with her, you know. Didn't, <laughs> I, I don't know, I've heard you talk about it. Like I didn't even, I didn't even introduce her to oh, Mickey. Yeah. I, just, I just sort of put her there and I said, okay, yeah. someone's gonna knock on the door in a second and, yeah, and then we're just gonna go. Yeah, that was my favorite. That's just how on the spot everything was. I, I didn't say one word to Mickey before we were shooting our first scene. The first thing I ever said to you, I think, was, you're an asshole. <laughs> I've heard but that from sitting. women before. <laughs> um, but, it, yeah. but it was great. And I mean, we, we, we rarely even spoke unless we were, no. we were doing we were a working. scene. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Were, we were working. And I think it helped the characters, too, because there was supposed to be that distance and that, that longing between the two. So I loved the style. I loved that way of working. Well, I never did a movie where I I had a daughter or anything like that, so that was very strange to me uh, to have such a pretty daughter, and um, that was so fucked up. I mean, you know, I had to try to make it personal because I guess I had abandoned her or whatever because I was busy with trying to fit into my tights, and she became like a kind of a drug addict, lesbian, uh, something strange, I guess, <laughs> like me. Yeah. Take after my father. Yeah. Well, I, I can take no credit for the Bruce Springsteen song. The reason there is a Bruce Springsteen song at the end of the film called The Wrestler is because um, of Bruce's love for Mickey, period, the end. Uh, Bruce and Mickey are old friends. They met at the Stone Pony in Asbury Park when Mickey was shooting there years ago. 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Yeah. And uh, Mickey, I mean, I did, you know, I still, um, you know, Bruce uh, called me on the phone and I talked to him and uh, he basically always you know, just believed in Mickey and has been waiting, like a lot of fans out there, for Mickey to have a shot. And he just, he read the screenplay and he felt like it really fit well for Mickey and it could really show Mickey shine, so he went for it. And he actually wrote this, he wrote it before we finished cutting the film, so um, he saw it without seeing the movie, but I mean, it's it just, me and Mickey completely teared up when we heard it because he really captured the spirit of it. No, are you teared up? I teared up, sorry, I didn't check it. You didn't. Do you want to add? No, but he wrote it. Bruce was very busy. He wrote it. He was on a European tour. He took the time. You know, he, we corresponded by letter. And um, he took the time to say, yeah, okay, if I have time, Mick, I'll, you know, I'll do what I can, if I can. And, you know, it was also, um, he responded to me the week uh, that he lost a member of his band that's been with him for 30 years. And then... Uh, several months before that, he'd lost another band member that he had for 30 years. So he had a lot on his plate, and it, he was just, uh, you know, for somebody that didn't have the easiest year in the world, he took, you know, he did something very generous and really, really special. I actually got stage fright when I first met him. Literal straight stage fright. Not you, but, but Bruce. So I was just sort of like, oh gosh, yeah. here I am with the boss. <laughs> Uh, the deep loneliness of my character. Yeah, I didn't have a problem with that. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I've been like that for a, ever since, ever since for, for a long time. Um, as far as, uh, what was the first part of your, your question before? No, the other thing is I was very fortunate because um, I'm real funny about working with actors. And I was very fortunate that, you know, um, to work with Evan because I had a lot of scenes that were really strong. And um, it's very rare that you come across somebody who's 20 years old that I, I found like her, her scenes that she had in the movie were very difficult on an emotional scale level where she had to reach. And the first take, I thought she was really fucking good. Then we do another one she was better. And then I went, wow, this bitch can really act. And 
I would see her over in the corner. I was thinking, who the fuck did she study with? Because you don't see people these days that, I don't give a fuck, they're 20, 30, 40, that have her ability and also her focus and concentration for me was like really something special to look at because you, to see, to observe some really fine acting. And I'm going, shit, I couldn't do that when I was 20, <laughs> you know? Well, oh, that, that means so much. I mean, I've, um, I had, uh, my parents were actors and, and film geeks. So, you know, I grew up watching Mickey and, you know, always thought that he was just incredible and was so excited for the opportunity to get to work with him and um, excited for him. And, um, I mean, if you hadn't seen the end of Angel Heart and you were an actor, it was sacrilegious, you know, like, you, you would get smacked on the forehead. Um, Who was the boy? <laughs> I don't remember that one. <laughs> um, and um, we, I, I mean, the whole experience was really special to me. I was separated yeah. from my father for most of my life, and we just um, reconciled after I filmed the movie. Actually, we have a great relationship now. But so, you know, while doing it, it was extremely difficult for me to really, you know, have to go there and, and to do those scenes. It hit very close to home. So I was so happy to be with somebody like Darren, who was taking care of me every second and was completely there for me, while still, you know, not being afraid to, to, to push me. And, um, I really appreciated it, and I, you know, Mickey and I really shared something very special, and um, so the film will always mean a great deal to me. <laughs> you know, um, one of the concerns that um, we were all concerned about even coming to Venice was um, our reception here, because wrestling is not a sport in this country, or, or that's extremely popular, but I think what happens with um, any athlete, whether he be a soccer player, a football player, a basketball player, or a fighter. Or a ballet dancer. Yeah, you reach an age where you can no longer perform up to the standard that you used to. And when you train your whole life to do a sport, there comes a day when somebody, usually it's not yourself, says it's time to go. And usually there's nowhere to go. So, you know, it's something that's universal with life and, and with sports that um, I think every athlete can relate to no matter what sport they're in. You got me? Okay. I don't think we would have ever had a chance to work with the mainstream wrestling world, which will re re remain nameless right now. Um, it just wasn't an option. I don't think they were interested in this type of portrayal of wrestling. Um, so I think we were forced to work uh, and one of the earliest decisions of working on the screenplay was to set it in the independent world. I also thought that the independent world was more interesting and more colorful. Um, and so that's where the research went. And I, I think that in the very early development of the script, that's what led us to a sort of um, older wrestler who wasn't, uh, who was past his prime, uh, because that would explain why he was wrestling in that world. So it kind of led to that. I think the whole project started with, I just had, I was just curious why no one had really made a serious film about wrestling. I mean, boxing is basically a genre on itself. There's, there's so many movies that are about boxing, but no one had ever looked at wrestling. And uh, I think it's because they thought it was a joke, but the more you look into it, the more you realize that it's an actual, there is a sport involved. How many people think the film is hopeful? <laughs> Okay, that was good, okay. Um, wow, that's a very deep question. Um, you know, I, I think I'm an optimist in general, and I think all my films are optimistic. I mean, even Requiem for a Dream, I think why I was attracted to it was because Hubert Selby Jr. just so well painted the darkness that all it could do was reveal the light. So, you know, for me, it's all about the humanity of the characters and uh, I, you know, and the humanity of the actors that brought those characters alive. And uh, I guess I look at the human condition as a hopeful one, even though I'm pretty pessimistic with what's going on in the world right now. You know, I, I think you have to hold on to the true stories and hope that there's some salvation within ourselves.
My mother grounded me for watching Requiem for a Dream, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yes. Wow. <laughs> Got in big trouble for that. It also kept you off drugs. Yes. In the beginning, when I met Darren, I very much wanted to work with Darren because I heard a lot of, uh, I heard a lot of nice things about Darren. I heard he didn't compromise, that he was his own man, and uh, he had a very large brain, and he didn't take any shit from anybody, and he didn't want to go out to Hollywood and make a lot of money and really bad movies. So I went, this is the kind of guy that I want to work with. But I didn't necessarily want to play a role that reminded me of there's certain things in athletics or what have you that I can't do anymore. You know, it's like I'm not going to ever be the kind of guy that's going to sit, sit in a fucking rocking chair. Uh, so it's kind of painful to realize that time goes by, you can't do what you used to do. Um, I have a lot of problems with that, even still, you know. Uh, but, you know, I wish I made this movie 20 years ago because um, you get, uh, even though this uh, wrestling is entertainment, you really get hurt. I mean, a lot of these professional wrestlers right now um, that have retired, they can't walk, they can't do any other kind of jobs because it, it smashes your joints and your bones and um, it just really messes you up. And uh, that was something that I liked what, what Darren did is he made it close to like a documentary instead of glamorizing it. You know, this was not, this was not a Rocky movie. This was more about like, these guys end up uh, when they're only in their 40s and 50s in, you know, in rocking chairs or wheelchairs. And I wasn't really aware of that until we did all the research. I mean, there was a lot of influences from uh, John Huston's Fat City to all the way up to the Dardenne brothers now. I think it's, you know, that type of verite approach is, um, you know, something that works. I, I just found it working, as I said earlier, so well for... Mickey's uh, performance in this film, and it was also I wanted to capture that the immediacy of, of of the story. I also wanted to, I mean, for me, the, the evolution through my last three films was towards a lot of control, where the fountain, everything was, uh, everything was perfectly constructed how I wanted it. So I wanted to sort of move the complete opposite away from that, and I uh, so anything that gave freedom was what I was looking for. But, uh, you know, the cinema of the 70s was a big influence from Barbe Schroeder working in Barfly to John Huston to Vendors to, I mean, there's so many uh, gods that, that helped inspire this film. I wouldn't call Barbe a god. <laughs> Mickey, you had a question. Um, yeah, you asked about the similarities. I mean, this is a character or a man who's past his prime that's living in a trailer, whose wife left him, whose daughter is a dyke and a junkie. and um, He's a dreamer who's living uh, like shit, and he's living in a state of shame. And yeah, I can parallel it to what I did with my career. I threw my career away 15 years ago and um, didn't work for well, up until recently. Um, and it's better if you almost never accomplished anything in your life to be a has-been because there's, n there's no worse feeling to be feeling shameful all the time. It's like a really small feeling and, uh, and usually um, you're, the one, you're the blame for it. You have nobody to blame but yourself. Um, yeah, the ram is a, is a mess. 